Now that we've discussed how people get their food, the most basic necessity of life, we can start talking about how they get the rest of what they need. This falls under the umbrella of economy, but we're not going to be talking about supply and demand curves in this course. The economy is the social institution concerned with systems of production, distribution, and consumption of resources. Economics is the social science dedicated to the study of the economy. To put it another way, economics is the study of how and why people choose to utilize their resources the way they do. Much of the field of economics, though, is closely focused on quantifying Western market economies, and it doesn't apply very well to the sorts of non-Western economies that anthropologists typically encounter in the field. While anthropology has taken much inspiration from economics, the same is true in the other direction. Anthropologists have provided economists with insights into how economic principles work in other cultures. The basic idea of economics is that resources are scarce. That is, there isn't enough of them to satisfy everyone's wants. A society, therefore, has to have some method of determining how to use the limited resources it has. Economics is about decision making and how those decisions are made varies from one culture to another. An economy has three phases. Production, when resources in their natural state are transformed into useful products. Distribution, when those products are moved to where and who will use them. And consumption, when those products are used for some purpose, which may or may not be their intended purpose. We'll examine each phase of economic activity in turn. Production is the process of acquiring natural resources and turning them into useful products, the things we need to make a living. All production involves transforming aspects of nature into something else, be that iron ore turned into a steel tool or compounds in the soil being taken up into wheat that then gets turned into a loaf of bread. All of the subsistence strategies we discussed in the last lecture are part of the production process, taking the nutrients in the environment and turning them into useful meals. But to achieve that transformation, we must have means of production, or ways of harnessing and transforming resources. Means of production include land, on which resources can be found, labor, through which they can be acquired, and technology or capital, tools that are valuable because they can help us make new things that are valuable. The means of production are scarce, just like natural resources, so we must make decisions about how to use them. As an example, let's examine how a culture's subsistence strategy affects the use of one of the most important means of production, land. Every culture has rules for how land is to be allocated and used. Because land has a direct impact on food supplies, land allocation rules are closely tied to subsistence. In hunting and gathering societies, the individual seldom owns exclusive access to particular territories. This is because the land itself isn't particularly valuable or scarce. Hunter-gatherers have very low populations. They can always find more land. What they have a limited supply of, however, is food and the food moves around the landscape as herds migrate or as different plants come into season. So individual hunter-gatherers don't own land because they must move to different territories as the food moves. With the system of land ownership, they might not have access to the new territory because someone else already owns it. On the other hand, communal ownership of very large territories is a common trait among hunter-gatherers. In this case, the territory is large enough that adequate food supplies are known to be present somewhere in it, and everyone who belongs to the culture has equal access to those resources. Outsiders, however, may be prohibited from gathering food within the communal territory, or they may have to ask permission before doing so. In this case, the community owns the resources in their territory by prohibiting others from getting access to those resources. Hunter-gatherers in the Arctic, Africa, South America, and rural Australia all owned land in this way. 
at least until modern governments forced them to give up their territories. The situation among pastoralists is very similar. Individuals typically do not own land, but the community as a whole does. The big difference here is that as food producers, pastoralists typically do own livestock privately. Livestock are both a product and a means of production, since sometimes they're the end goal, as in dinner, and sometimes they're just a source of secondary products like wool or milk. Herds are the basic storage units for wealth in pastoral societies, and individuals can invest labor in their personal herds to increase their size and wealth. In hunting and gathering societies, no one person invests much labor in the creation and tending of wild food sources, so everyone has equal access to those foods. But in pastoralism, individuals do invest significant amounts of labor in individual animals, so they have control over the disposition of those resources, whether to slaughter the animals, breed them, or continue to support them to get their secondary products. Pastoralists in the Middle East and Central Asia tend to own land and property in this way. Among horticultural societies, the system of land ownership is more or less a mixture of the hunting, gathering, and pastoral patterns. Since horticulture must shift from garden plot to garden plot frequently, particular locations on the landscape have little value in and of themselves. The group still owns territory communally, but individuals or families do not own particular plots permanently. However, during the period when a particular plot is in production, a single family has invested much time and labor in clearing, planting, and tending that plot. So, like pastoralists with their herds, that family has control over that plot. Others must acquire permission before using the plot or its produce. However, this is more of a lease than ownership, since once the plot becomes unproductive and your family no longer gardens there, the land reverts to communal ownership and anyone can use it. Finally, agricultural societies generally have a system of full-blown land ownership where an individual or family has exclusive ownership of the land more or less permanently. Since in an agricultural system, the particular plot will remain productive more or less permanently, ownership is more or less permanent as well. This is the system we have in our own society. Now, this example shows how economic questions about the use of land are integrated with the subsistence strategy of a community. Similar decisions must be made about all of the various means of production, and those decisions are similarly integrated with the rest of culture. But even when we've allocated those means of production, resources still exist in an undeveloped state. Even with hunting and gathering, someone must gather the food and cook it. In most human cultures throughout history, the second most important means of production has been human labor. People, either individually or in groups, use their own muscle power to produce goods. Simple technology assisted them, but the energy required to transform the resource came ultimately from their own muscles, or occasionally from beasts of burden. It's only in the past couple centuries that mechanized production, using machines and non-human sources of power like fossil fuels, have become a dominant source of energy. This kind of technology is what's most often referred to as capital. On the other hand, anthropologists are less interested in how production takes place and more so in how it's organized. Mode of production is the way that production is organized in a culture. There are many modes of production, but some are much more common than others. When they were first documented by Western groups, most cultures were typified by the domestic mode of production, where members of individual households pool their labor to produce goods that will be consumed by the household itself. As a general rule, humans are lazy. They only work as much as necessary, and in a domestic mode of production, as much as necessary is what's needed for the survival and relative comfort of the household. Thus, foragers gather as much food each day as their family will eat that day, then they spend the rest of the day relaxing or visiting relatives. Most farmers only grow as many crops as they'll eat in the next year, plus enough to have seed for next season's crops. 
The domestic mode of production generally does not produce a surplus, and everyone in the society lives more or less the same lifestyle. In the last few centuries in the West, and since Western contact in other parts of the world, most cultures have shifted from the domestic to the industrial mode of production. Here, much of the work of transforming raw materials into usable goods depends on expensive machines, that is, capital. They're so expensive that only some people, called capitalists, can afford them. So most people in the society are wage earners. They trade their labor in operating and maintaining the machines for wages, which they then exchange again for the goods they themselves originally helped produce. In a capitalist mode of production, there is a clear incentive to work harder, more wages, which can be converted back to any sort of good, not just the item one produces. Domestic producers do not produce much more than they need. More labor might produce a surplus of, say, shoes, but there's nothing to do with that surplus. Everyone in the family already has shoes. In a capitalist economy, however, the more you work to make shoes, the more wages you can accumulate, and those can be used to buy any sort of good. So large surpluses are produced and consumed throughout the society. The end goal of the production process is a set of goods and commodities that meet the needs of the community. We've seen how different economies allocate the means of production, most particularly land, and how the relationships are organized by the mode of production. But we still haven't looked at what is probably the most important question about production? What should we be producing in the first place? Eric Wolf, one of the most important economic anthropologists, divides the products of an economic system into five different funds based on what sorts of needs they satisfy. That is, according to Wolf, every economy must produce things that meet several different kinds of needs. The subsistence fund meets the nutritional needs of a community and is an essential component of any economy. Thus, a subsistence strategy of some sort is a cultural universal. Second, the replacement fund includes products that replace or maintain technology, the means of production. It is also essential. Next, the social fund meets the needs of building and maintaining social relationships gifts, for example. Again, all economies produce goods of this sort. The ceremonial fund consists of those products that are used in ceremonies or rituals. While religious activities of this sort are universal, the degree to which economic resources beyond time and labor must be invested will vary greatly. In some cultures, everyday objects can be used in both ritual and secular contexts. In others, special ritual objects, a ceremonial fund, must be produced. Finally, some societies also require a rent fund, goods produced for the support of political superiors, think taxes. The rent fund only exists in economies of societies that have political superiors, of course, so egalitarian economies lack this fund. Having produced the goods a society needs or wants, however, those goods must still be distributed to the people who will use them. Even with a domestic mode of production where people, for the most part, produce for their own consumption, not everyone can always produce everything they need. Hunters may have poor luck when hunting, farmers may not have access to a forge for fixing their own plows. So the study of distribution looks at how goods produced by one person make their way to the people who actually use them. To start with, we must talk about modes of exchange. The mode of exchange is the manner in which goods change hands and what's expected to result from the exchange. There are three basic modes of exchange, reciprocity, redistribution, and markets. Reciprocity takes place between equals and is often considered something like a gift exchange. A gift is given to one participant by another, but a return gift is not necessarily immediately offered. In this case, accepting the gift creates a debt, 
an obligation or expectation that the recipient returns the gift at a later time. There are three basic kinds of reciprocity based on what each participant expects to get out of the exchange. Positive or generalized reciprocity is practiced with one's inner circle of family and close friends. The goal of the gift giver is to be generous and altruistic and to give more than he receives in return. The return gift is delayed indefinitely and no one keeps track of debts. Positive reciprocity is essentially open sharing of goods and in extreme cases may look like the absence of private property. Balanced reciprocity takes place between people who know each other well, but who are not very close to one another, allies in other words. Here, the goal is to give as good as you get to balance the accounts. The debt is expected to be cleared in relatively short order, though an exact time and place may not be specified. Think trading favors. Negative reciprocity takes place between strangers or those who only know one another very slightly. The goal is to get more out of the deal than you give to make a profit. A return gift is expected in very short order or even immediately. Reciprocal horse raiding among Plains Indians is a good example of negative reciprocity. After one village raided and stole horses from another, a reprisal raid was always expected in short order. Everyone's goal was always to steal more horses from their enemies than they had stolen from them in return. The second mode of exchange is redistribution. In short, redistribution is when a central authority gathers goods then returns them to others depending on where they're needed. What a particular producer gets back is not necessarily what he paid in, either in amount or in kind. In fact, if it were, there'd be no point. Instead, each person produces one kind of good and receives another, so that everyone has access to all the necessary products. Communal storehouses storing food against the possibility of famine are a classic example of redistribution. Everyone contributes, but only the hungry get anything back. Income taxes are another example. You pay money to the government, and the government returns that money to you in the form of roads, services, and so forth. Note that the central authority, the government, also supports itself from the goods it collects. Thus, not as much flows down the political hierarchy as goes up. The part that stays up is consumed by the government and constitutes the rent fund. Redistribution, like the rent fund, only exists in societies that have a hierarchy. The third mode of exchange is the marketplace. In a marketplace, goods are brought to a central location and exchanged for other goods, just as in redistribution. However, in a market economy, there is no coordinating authority that determines which goods go where and when. Instead, impersonal market forces of supply and demand serve to coordinate exchange. The field of economics devotes most of its attention to market exchange because that's the primary mode of exchange in complex Western economies. After goods are produced and distributed, they are consumed, that is, used for whatever purpose they fulfill. Ultimately, they are either recycled, treated as a resource and produced into another good, or they're discarded. All of these processes are also the focus of economic anthropology, but there is less to say about them in general. Instead, studies focus on specific ethnographic examples rather than broader theory. As such, we won't discuss consumption beyond just acknowledging that it exists. Like subsistence, economy is a basic social institution universal to all cultures. These two institutions satisfy the basic biological needs of humans and as such, they are deeply integrated with almost every other aspect of culture. In the next lecture, we'll look at another very important social institution, gender.